Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This afternoon it is a very special one. Let me welcome all of you. And also let me start our opening session. Mr. James T. Watson, Excellencies, Mr. Morales, Distinguished Guests, University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce, Administrations, Ladies and Gentlemen, Welcome to the special lecture on Beyond East, West, North, South Peace and Prosperity in a Four-Speed World. Again, it is a very great honor for the university to host such a special speech by the internationally recognized and renowned speaker. For those who have been here for several times, may I say to you, welcome home. In a few minutes, we will start the welcome remark with Assistant Professor Dr. Sawani Tayorumuro, the Vice President for Research. May I now have the honor of Assistant Professor Dr. Sawani Tairumuro, the Vice President for Research, to give a welcome speech about this great event. Mr. James Wilkinson, Excellencies, Mr. Marabet, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce, may I welcome all of you to a special lecture co-organized by the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce and the International Peace Foundation. It is an honor for us to have Mr. James Wilkinson as our guest speaker on the very significant topic of Beyond East West South, North, Peace and Prosperity in a Four-Speed World. As we are well aware that poverty has always been the first priority of world agenda. The World Bank is one of many organizations which plays a vital role in economic boost and in poverty reduction. Mr. Wilkinson's past experience as the president of the World Bank and his lecture today will give you an inspiration to help to eliminate world poverty, restore peace and prosperity. According to the United Nations, about 25,000 people die every day of hunger for hunger or hunger-related causes. Although there is plenty of food in the world for everyone. The problem is that hungry people are trapped in severe poverty. Their malnourishment finally results in sickness and death. Another factor which is tremendously involved in the world poverty crisis is the speedy globalization. Economic globalization has linked the North, the South, the East, and the West together in some way. However, what needs to be urgently developed are peace culture and community building. In order to achieve this, we must cooperate in generating people's ideas and knowledge together. We need to continue promoting greater contacts between us at all levels to create mutual appreciation and understanding among youths grown-ups and a strong belief in the value of peace. This special lecture on Beyond East, South, East, West, South, North, Peace and Prosperity in a Four-Speed World will provide a forum for interested participants to exchange ideas and cooperation regarding the issue on global peace and prosperity in our world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Assistant Professor Dr. Sawani Tairuro for your warm welcome. And uh, at this moment, I would like to invite Mr. Ove Morabes, Chairman of the Board of Directors in the National Peace Foundation, to deliver his opening address.
Good morning, Jack. And welcome to the first ASEAN wide event series, Bridges Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace. Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non political and non religious foundation, under the patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including some of the country's major universities. Having started in November 2007, Bridges is continuously held in Thailand and the Philippines until April 2008, involving the participation of Nobel laureates and other eminent keynote speakers. The first ASEAN series of Bridges is an independent contribution to the Decade for a Culture of Peace and Nonviolence, initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. It follows the Bridges series, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand between November 2003 and April 2005. The plural Pluralistic Forum of Bridges highlights the International Peace Foundation's intercultural and transdisciplinary approach towards peace. The Foundation doesn't take sides, but acts as a mediator by creating an independent platform for dialogue where representatives of science Politics, economy, culture, religion, the media, and youth can meet, share their viewpoints, listen to each other, and find mutual ways of understanding and cooperation. Therefore, the foundation itself is a bridge and a facilitator between different language groups in our divided societies where politicians speak another language than artists, and business and religious leaders another one than scientists. In a highly interdependent world, Problems cannot be solved by either one of these language groups only, but by finding ways of working together. After the success of Bridges in Thailand, the International Peace Foundation has been invited by other ASEAN countries to build further bridges towards peace and international understanding by expanding its program beyond Thailand to stimulate the intellectual, scientific and cultural exchange in the region. The first ASEAN Bridges series, therefore, continuously takes place in Thailand and the Philippines from November 2007 to April 2008, comprising events with Nobel laureates from all fields, as well as other keynote speakers, who visit the, re the region not all at once, but separately, to conduct public lectures, seminars, workshops, and dialogues hosted by local institutions during a continued period of six months. The topics of the ongoing events deal with the overall theme of building a culture of peace and development in a globalized world, and with a wide range of issues in the field of politics, economy, science, culture, and the media. They especially highlight the challenges of both globalization and regionalism and its impact on development and international cooperation. The aim of Bridges is to facilitate and strengthen dialogue and communication between societies in Southeast Asia with their multiple cultures and faiths, as well as, with, as well as with peoples in other parts of the world, to promote understanding and trust. The events aim at building bridges with local universities and other institutions in Southeast Asia to establish long-term relationships with Nobel laureates, experts, and decision makers, which may result in common research programs and other forms of collaboration. By enhancing science, technology, and education as a basis for peace and development, the events aim and may lead to a better cooperation for the advancement of peace, freedom, and security in the region with the active involvement of the young generation, ASEAN's key to the future. This is why Bridges is not designed as a one-time event, but as a continuing process of synergies to make this series of events a sustainable success for Thailand, for the Philippines, and for Southeast Asia as a whole. I'm grateful to the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce and its president, Dr. Chirudit Ausuwat, as well as to our other partners and sponsors who have enabled us to make the idea of bridges a reality. I would like to thank all of you present today for taking part in this program. May it help us to facilitate a new culture of peace through dialogue, transcending its definition as merely the absence of war or armed conflict into a new understanding of what the basis for peace really is, education. In this spirit, we welcome today the former president of the World Bank, Mr. James Wolfenson, 
who has agreed to come to Thailand to support the events. We all look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. Thank you very much. And now, it's time for the highlight of this very special event. This afternoon, I have the singular honor and privilege of introducing our distinguished keynote speaker, Mr. James D. Wolfenson, whose great experiences, honors, and awards are hard to tell in such a very short time. Let me briefly introduce him to you. Mr. James D. Wolfenson was born in Australia and is a naturalized U.S. citizen. He holds a Bachelor Degree of Arts and Law from the University of Sydney and a Master Degree of Business Administration from the Harvard Graduate School of Business. For his business career, he was a Managing Director of the bank's New York City office and later became a Senior Executive at Solomon Brothers. Currently. He runs his Wolfenson and Company LLC, a private investment firm and advisory providing strategy consulting advice, advice to governments and large corporations. Since 2005, he has also been the chairman of the International Advisory Board of Citigroup and an honorary trustee at the Brookings Institute. For his honors, since uh, there are a lot, Mr. Wolfenson has received numerous awards throughout his life. The recent one is University of New South Wales conferred an honorary degree of Doctor of Science in 2006. His successful initiatives are a lot as well. Let me name three of them. Comprehensive Development Framework, Development Dialogue on Values and Ethics, World Bank and Anti-Corruption. His public service, as all of us know, Mr. Wolfenson became president of the World Bank in 1995 and served the second five-year term in 2000, becoming the third person to serve two terms in the position. During this term as president, he visited more than 120 countries around the world. Upon leaving the World Bank in 2005, he assumed the post of special envoy for Gaza disengagement for the quartet on the Middle East until 2006. And also in 2005, he founded the Wolfenson Center, a Washington DC based think tank, and current projects focus on youth exclusion in the Middle East, large scale anti-poverty programs, reforms of global economic governance, and regional cooperation, particularly in Central Asia. And this afternoon, he has brought with him a special speech called Beyond East, West, North, South, Peace, and Prosperity in a Four-Speed World. We look forward to hearing from you, Mr. Wolfenson. The audience is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our spectacular keynote speaker, Mr. James D. Wolfenson. It's a great pleasure to be back uh, in Bangkok uh, and having the opportunity to speak to a subject that I care about a lot and which I know many people in this audience uh, are concerned about. Uh, in case you think I have slides, I don't have any. Uh, so I don't know, oh, there it is, that's me. Uh, we, uh, my wife and I have had the uh, many pleasant opportunities to visit this country and are well aware of the environment in which we're now participating. And <coughs> rather than dealing with the local politics, I thought I would deal uh, a little more generally uh, with Asia and uh, with the subject uh, that has been outlined to you, which is the so-called four-speed world. But before doing that, let me uh, comment that uh, the issues which I think are critical 
uh, in Asia now, uh, issues which very sadly have not adequately been assessed or addressed in uh, North America or in Europe until relatively recently. Indeed, when I was growing up professionally in Australia and then in the United States, the whole emphasis of my colleagues and myself uh, tended to be about what is going on in what we thought was the so-called developed world. It's the billion or so people today that live in the United States and in Europe and in other countries of the OECD, including Australia. And for us, the world more or less ended uh, at the borders of this uh, territory. Uh, my friend uh, Toyo Gyoten, who, as I think many of you uh, may know, uh, is a, a distinguished uh, Japanese civil servant who now is president of the Institute for International Monetary Affairs, commented uh, rather pointedly, I thought, in a speech he gave in 1964, and rather than reading a lot, let me just leave a little bit of this. He said, I still remember vividly the day when I went to a meeting of the Bank for International Settlements in Basel. He said it was the year of the Cultural Revolution sweeping China. Uh, but the meeting of the VIS central bankers from the European countries were gathered largely for cocktails, luncheons, and dinners, and talked endlessly about gold, the dollar, sterling, switching from English, French, and German. There was absolutely no interest in China, no interest in India, and no interest in Asia. The Vietnam War was at a critical stage. And the bankers had very little interest in such events. I thought uneasily that for these bankers, the world seemed still to end somewhere near the Dardanelles. And of course, that was the position uh, that so many of the international bankers were adopting uh, until recent years. Indeed, when I joined the World Bank uh, some 12 years ago now, I found that in seeking to address the questions of development, it was not as easy as I had expected to be able to convince people that the future of the world was not going to be dependent on the billion or so people that lived in the so-called rich countries, but would be dependent on the other five billion people living in the developing world. And that unless there was some bridge of understanding, quoting from Mr. Morrow today, some bridge of understanding and some steps that would be taken to bring about a link uh, between those in the so-called rich world and those in the developing world, that we would be headed, in fact, uh, for a very unfortunate period in the years ahead. The numbers, I think you know, are really quite important, and it's probably worth setting them out just at the beginning to give you the framework of what I'm concerned about. If you take the figures in roughly 2000, and I've rounded these numbers, you had roughly 6 billion people on the planet. A billion of them lived in the rich countries, and five billion of them lived in the so-called developing countries, which of course includes four billion or so in Asia, occupying a third of the world's uh, land areas. But if you cast your mind forward to the year 2050, the best estimates that can be given, and no one is quite certain, but the sort of median estimates are, that you'll have a world not of six billion, but of nine billion. And the billion or so that lives in the rich country will grow by maybe a hundred million. And the developing world will grow by 2.9 billion. So give or take in the year 2050, we'll have a world which is close to 8 billion people living in what we call now the developing countries. And a billion, 100 million or so in the rich countries. This is a dramatic shift in terms of population. But what is even more interesting is the trend that is likely to occur in terms of the share of the developing world, and indeed the share particularly of Asia, in terms of this move uh, to view economic development. Truth is that in 1990, Asia accounted for roughly 8% of the world's GDP. By 07, it was nearly 
And the best projections we have for 2050 are that it will be 57%. 57%. This is a dramatic change. Not historically, because in the year 1500 and the year 1820, China and India were roughly 50% of the global GDP. But with the Industrial Revolution, we saw a major change, a major shift to the United States and to Europe, and the position of Asia for both issues of the Industrial Revolution and the political issues with which you're very familiar, both in terms of the end of colonialism and the rise of communism. We saw a falling back of Asia and then world wars changing the position of Japan as well. That is now reversed, reversing in a really dramatic way and reversing even since the period of the 60s. I was reading in Bob Kagan's book, Dangerous Nation, of a visit of young Meiji reformers who were visiting the United States in 1960. And they came back and in their report, they were commenting on the fact that in the United States they had flushed toilets, uh, which were not then adequately known in Japan. What a change in the intervening period as we have the bullet train in Japan and we see everything that has transpired in terms of technology in that country since, the, since that time. And so it is that the pendulum uh, that swung to the United States and swung to Europe and to the OECD countries is now manifestly swinging back, swinging back to Asia. And this is a realization that falls hard on, I think, many in of my generation, uh, because it, it wasn't like that. It's what not we grew up in. Asia was the place that you were nice to if you went there, and that you stepped away from. Uh, if you wanted to get graduate work or education, you went to Europe. And there I say it, that sadly today, less than 9% of the graduates of American universities come to Asia and 65% still go to Europe, learning French and German and other languages. A change which I find quite disturbing, but which is in fact true. When I graduated in 1957 in Australia, I tried to get a scholarship to go to study in Asia. There were no scholarships. I discovered a university in Hokkaido, in Japan, which had a school of Commonwealth Studies. But I was late, and so unfortunately I had to go to Harvard instead, <laughs> uh, which, wasn't, which, which, which was not all that bad, I might tell you, from my, my career. But I might be Japanese today, I might even have a Japanese wife. <laughs> uh, uh, after 46 years, and who knows what would have happened if that had happened. In any event, I, I, I didn't, and I, I went, and I married a young lady from down the street uh, in Wellesley, and, and we lived happily ever after. But, but that, was, that was not my first choice. I've never admitted this in front of my wife until today. <laughs> uh, it was not my first choice. And, and, and so I went to study, and of course, as I entered my own professional career, it became very clear to me that the movement was in Asia. May I say, the movement was in Thailand as well. If I can trust the UN statistics, and I'm never sure that I can, uh, they do say that in the last 25 years, your country has moved the number of people living under a dollar a day from 22% to 2%, and that's a fantastic move. If it's true, uh, if it's nearly true, it's still a pretty good uh, result. But I am aware of the differences in, the, in this country from my work in the bank between the rural areas and the city areas and the, uh, the need for additional development that exists here as it does throughout Asia. On the other hand, as I again look at these statistics, again, if I can believe them, poverty has been addressed, malnutrition has significantly addressed. The uh, Millennium Development Goals largely uh, uh, being achieved. Uh, child labor and infant mortality, vast improvements, significant improvements in clean water in your country and certainly in the atmosphere uh, in this city alone, and uh, a move to universal primary education, which I was discussing 
earlier today. And in this last year, a continuation of the process of increased trade, uh, which is uh, moving well ahead. And uh, may I say, in that increase in IT exports, a, a general feeling of an excitement in terms of economic development. And I just in passing want to say that you've done good work also in relation to AIDS. But what else has been happening in Asia? The other enormous switch that we've seen is what's happening with the global reserves. We now have roughly uh, five trillion dollars, five thousand billion dollars of global reserves. And what do we find? <coughs> we find that of these reserves, the largest volume of reserves, as you know, is in China. Today. One and a half trillion dollars. And I won't bore you with the list, but as you run down the list, you become very conscious of the fact that the weight of the inclusion of these reserves is that more than 60% is in this region. And it looks as though China, talking to the financial minister last week, may add between three and four hundred billion more in this coming year. And that is separate from the few hundred billion dollars that they have tucked away in Hong Kong. So this is great, except the United States has opted for the order of 70 billion. Uh, as we look at this 1,600 billion, we come to the bottom of the list and find near the bottom of the United States itself. This is, again, a dramatic change. And as we look at Japan, which ranks second on the list, and as we look at the accumulation of reserves in developing countries, we're seeing a change in balance in terms of the way the West was able to look at development, and in particular, the way the West was able to look at Asia. It is not any longer uh, a series of countries that needs to be helped, uh, where there is low uh, labor cost and opportunity for exports. It is indeed a country that is now a capital provider uh, for the rest of the world, which is a hugely significant shift even in the last decade. And the other thing that's happening is, I need hardly tell you in this part of the world, is the increase in the middle class, notably in China and in India. The numbers vary, and I don't know which ones to give you, but it's not impossible to say, and I think nor unsupportable to say, that in China uh, we will have some 600 million people uh, by the year 2025 that will have incomes ranging between 13,000 and 50,000 US dollars in current time. That is middle class. India, which started, as you know, later in terms of its own economic development in terms of hitting the populace at large, India will have, according to the same McKinsey statistics, some 550 million people. 50 million they have at present, but growing to 550 million, growing 10 times by 2025. And so between these two countries, we have a new middle class which will exceed the middle class of certainly uh, Europe and will be an emotive force in itself uh, to economic development. So it's no longer an Asia which is looking to export necessarily and solely to the United States or to Europe. It's a Asia which is growing rapidly itself and where there is a counterbalance uh, to what happens in, in that part of the world. And this growth has very significant consequences because it also means that Asia is looking to other parts of the world itself as the engine driver as distinct from something that follows. You only have to look at this last two years at what's happened in regard to Africa. Within the last two years, as you probably know, the Chinese government hosted uh, the heads of government of Africa for their annual meeting. And I understand will host shortly a second one. That was a very unusual occurrence, uh, but one which, according to my African friends who were at the conference, was better done than it had it done anywhere else, and was uh, superbly prepared, and which will continue to be uh, 
prepared well, I'm sure, but which followed on uh, freeing up uh, by the Chinese of over $10 billion of loans, which they just forgave, and a program of between 5 and $10 billion uh, for industrial development, which for any of you that have been to China would not be surprised as you go in almost any Chinese, any African country today, and you find the town hall being, having been built by Chinese, the cultural center having been built by Chinese. And even when you get out into the countryside, as Elaine and I did recently in one of the African countries, looking at the prospect of housing development, finding 20 Chinese there as the locally chosen developer uh, by uh, an African. Uh, who was our partner in that enterprise. So China is not letting Africa go, and of course there is an historic Indian population in Africa, particularly on the east coast of Africa, which makes that linkage extremely important and very, very real. The second thing that happened in this period was that 400 African businessmen, at the same time as the heads of state were meeting in China, they went to India. And the Indian government announced that they generated, and its private companies generated more than $10 billion of business at that meeting. This is a switch away from the paternalistic view of the United States and Europe uh, towards Africa, where we have a new dialogue going and a new opportunity emerging between the countries of Africa and the countries of Asia, and in particular and notably uh, China and India. I don't exclude the initiatives that might be taken by other companies, including your own. But it does represent also a challenge to this country that the initiatives are being taken significantly by the two more uh, populous countries of China and India. And it does represent a challenge to you in terms of your ability uh, to compete in these other developing parts of the world. So we see absolutely clearly today, a rise not only in Asia's activities within Asia itself, uh, which I've touched on in relation to India and China, but also its outreach to other parts of the developing world in a way that was simply unknown uh, a decade or so ago. And as we've seen, the change in the accumulation of reserves and the economic activity of change. And this is all part of really what I've come to call the changes in what is a force field. And what is a force field? It used to be that we had the developed world and the developing world. That was a two-speed world. If you were either rich or you were poor. And if you were rich, you stayed rich and gave something to the developing countries, not a hell of a lot. You pretended every year that you would give more, and the statistics showed that. But even today, for the increases in USA and European aid, if you look at them carefully, I have to say uh, are embarrassing in terms of the real flows of funding uh, for development purposes. That's the subject of a different speech, but I'll be glad to come back next year and do that one. If I but it is, it is a serious uh, issue. But in the world as we have it today, it's not just the rich and the poor. <clears throat> there are really now four groupings of countries that we see, and it's important to look at them as four groupings because it gives a different insight on what we're going to face in the years ahead. There's the so-called leading countries, the OECD countries, if you like, with GDP per capita of 36,000 and above. And they have... Uh, roughly 15% of the world's population. The so-called billion dollar, a billion people, 900 million people, the OECD countries. Then there's what I call the globalizers. These are the countries such as India and China, uh, which are moving ahead at an extremely rapid rate. They have incomes of less than $14,000 but they've got a rate of growth that's in excess of 3.5% a year. In the case of China, it's above 10% a year, or has recently been. In the case of India, close to that level. And those countries include uh, India and China and Hungary and Indonesia 
and Kazakhstan, and dare I say Thailand, uh, as one of the countries that is growing at this sort of rate, and of course the Russian Federation and Malaysia amongst the list of some 30 odd countries. Then there are a group of countries which have come to be known as the Rentians. This is a country around 55 of them, with about a billion plus people in it, where the moderate per capita income is $4,000, largely due to high commodity prices, but where the growth rate is less than 3.5%. In fact, in some cases, significantly less than 5%, there are 3.5% on a per capita basis because birth rates tend to be high in these countries and growth relatively low. Those are the countries like Algeria, Argentina, Egypt, Iran, Libya. Mexico is in there, but I think will, will change. Syria, Venezuela, Turkey, and a bunch of other countries amongst the 55. Now those are countries that have reasonable growth, not falling backwards, but not perhaps growing as fast as the tier two countries that I mentioned. And will have a decent living, but where there, well, frankly, is not going to be a dramatic improvement in their competitiveness or in their economic activity. And then there are what I call the laggards. These are the countries significantly in Africa, uh, which have within them, at the moment, a billion people. Uh, but which are growing very rapidly and which will, which will more than double in the next 30 or 40 years. In fact, as we project forward to 2050, we look at a world there where it will be 20% of the world's population, 25% of the world's population will be amongst these countries. Now that's an enormous number of people. The laggards having in a population of 9 billion people in the world, having 25% of that population, where the growth is simply not there, both as a result of their economic competitiveness and as a result of the increase in population uh, and growth. That's where your problem comes in terms of international stability. And this is no longer a population significantly about 80-85% of that population is in Africa. It's no longer a population that is uninformed. For any of you that have visited Africa, you will know that in almost every African village today, you have a wind-up radio, or you have, for many of the people in the airpiece, uh, which uh, they can have uh, telephonic information about the price of crops uh, for very little, and where they are linked. Uh, to the rest of the country. This is no longer a completely ignorant group. This is a group that is now being linked, and you can see it in the jungle in Latin America, and you can see it in Africa. So this two and a half million people is no longer just a group that you can forget as it is over on the side somewhere. This is a substantial body of people on our planet of where the opportunity for growth is simply not been achieved and where the outlook for growth is not very good. What is happening is you see China and India reaching out, is you see these countries in Africa particularly being used significantly for natural resource pools, for the mineral and mining rights, and if you're lucky enough to have oil, of course, you have a great advantage. But they're also being used as marketplaces for production from China and India. But in these countries, they are not being used as places that can be, uh, where you can develop the manufacturing activity which will create the jobs. They're being used essentially as export markets. And so we have coming up a serious and significant issue uh, that will divide our, our world into what I call this force field world. You'll have the world of give or take a billion in the rich world, of four billion in the next level, which is the China-India world, you'll have a billion or so in uh, the next level of the moderately growing, and then you'll have a quarter of the population, two and a half million, in the 
uh, Africa and other less developing countries. And this is a challenge uh, for all of us, uh, not just as a numbers game, because the numbers may vary and maybe we'll be out by 100 million or 200 million or out by a decade or five years in terms of it. It's not the numbers game. The game that is of, of, is of concern is the issue that it poses us in several areas. One is on the inequality. And inequality in young people has a habit of leading the violence at a certain level of youthful unemployment and youthful lack of youthful frustration. And that's been proven historically time and time and time again. And the second thing is the environmental degradation. The environmental degradation which comes with poverty and which is not limited, as we all know, uh, to the geographic boundaries of the developing countries. Environmental degradation is something which is felt on a global scale, just as there is a challenge of poverty on a global scale. And so these are the issues which I think are now starting, starting uh, to be understood by the leaders of the world. It's no longer an issue just for the specialists or the do-gooders of the World Bank or the development institutions who talk about poverty and the need to address it. It's now becoming an issue which because of global civility and because of environment is an issue that is confronting, confronting the rich world in a way that has been obvious to me for some time but which is now, thank God, being recognized you know, by the leadership of uh, the developed world. And we've seen this now in a number of ways. We've seen it with the ASEAN leaders coming together uh, in preliminary meetings in the late 90s. And in 1997, the so-called initiative for ASEAN integration. This is a plan that had a six-year life and it was concerned to improve infrastructure, human resource development, information and communications technology and regional and economic integration. And they were concerned not just with the rich countries but also with the countries like Cambodia and Laos and Myanmar uh, which are significantly behind as you know. This is not just a six year plan that has been entered into because of the rhetoric of a few fiery leaders. It's been entered into uh, because the leaders of the faster moving countries in these countries recognize that with interdependence between the countries in a very real way and trade within the countries and movement of people and indeed physical danger between the countries that this needs to be addressed not as a matter of charity but as a matter of self-interest. It is a new conception of the region. Years back, uh, in the 19th century, and in some parts of the 20th century, these issues were resolved by occupying a country next door and taking it to yourself. Today, uh, the issue is resolved through trade. And there, thank God, has not been the aggressive feelings of country to country that we had uh, in the last century and in the beginnings of this century. But if, it, if it's not there, then the question that arises is the question of income disparity and the question of stability based on economics. And that is the issue that I think is now of concern to the leaders around the world. One of them, interestingly, is Gordon Brown in England, who has been focusing on this for a decade, to my knowledge, and who has woken up, I think, a lot of the D7 leaders. But it's not just limited to Gordon, it is other leaders are now coming in and what we're seeing is, is a new form of relationship that is emerging. I don't want to leave immediately the environment and get back on to economics, at least for a moment. But it is worth noting that 14 of the 20 most polluted cities in the world are in China. And this issue of pollution is not just an issue for Zuzuders and environmentalists. This has become a hugely serious economic issue, which I think 
all of us recognize it exacerbates the issues of water, it exacerbates uh, the ability to live, and may I say, in the cases of India and China, has led not just to major health problems, but to premature deaths. I asked someone to get out to me the figures last year in China as a result of uh, the environmental degradation. And the numbers of last year put out by the government are between 350 to 400,000 premature deaths in China. 60,000 people died from diarrhea and other diseases, waterborne diseases. Economic cost to China, 2.7% of GDP. This is directly as a result of environment. So it's no longer perceived just as an issue for the do-gooders and the people who are uh, rich enough to care about environment. But all of a sudden, I think, thank God now, the world is starting to listen that the environmental issue is not an issue for specialists or do-gooders. It is an issue at the very core of economic development. And the same is true for employment. I have some examples drawn from the Philippines uh, where environmental degradation in the lowland rain-fed areas led to massive declines in rice production that pushed people to the highlands. The highlands, they found indigenous people who were already farming, so it led to conflict. Uh, and the conflict that uh, arose between them then exacerbated even further poverty uh, that there was in the area. I don't want to give you too many of these examples, but just hinting at them must make you understand that this is not a theoretical analysis. This is what happens when people lose their jobs. They go somewhere else to try and get jobs. They disrupt that local community and you leave the conflict. It's the oldest reason in the world to have conflict. But it still exists, and environment in this case is one of the clear examples of the way in which uh, that is emerging. I might add that if I'm correctly informed, in your own city of Bangkok, you've done a pretty damn good job in dealing with the issue of environment, and I do warmly congratulate you on it. According to my information, it's better than any other Asian city. And that has to be true because the United States Environmental Protection Agency said so. Uh, so uh, I hope that it is true, and I hope that, I hope that you enjoy for many years uh, the uh, results of the cleansing that we had. But what other things are we now seeing in the region? First of all, uh, we have seen that uh, China is now taking a tremendously active role. And let me just tell you some statistics that you might find interesting, and which I find interesting because of my period in the World Bank and my period working with the G7. I was, six years ago, at the very first meeting that uh, Jacques Chirac called, in which he invited leaders from the developing countries, not to attend the meetings of the G7, uh, but to, maybe you were there, kind of it, but to come for lunch and spend an hour after lunch. And we had at these meetings uh, President uh, Hu Jintao of China, uh, the then Prime Minister of India, uh, the uh, leader, Mr. Lula from Brazil, and Cabo Becky, and I think uh, Alessandro of Nigeria. And uh, they were each given eight minutes, eight minutes, to speak to the great leaders. And uh, President Hu uh, delivered a wonderful prepared speech. The President of India did the same, but it was a little difficult to understand in English, uh, but I'm sure it was an excellent speech. And then uh, President Lula, with a very good translator, spoke in Portuguese from Brazil. And he said uh, something I thought was extremely funny. He said how wonderful it was to be there as the son of a very poor laborer in Brazil. How he had been a union leader, and how great it was to be there in front of Tony Blair and Jacques Chirac and, and President Bush and all the other eight leaders that were there. Then he said, but since I am here, may I issue an invitation to you that 
perhaps next year you might like to have your meeting in Rio or in Sao Paulo. Because you want to get used to it, because in another 15 years, the G7 is only going to contain two of you that are here now, which will be the United States and Japan. And on or about that time, the leading force in the world will be China. India will be number three after the United States. But then will be Japan. And then will be, in whatever order he came up, and the Brazils and the Mexicos and the Vietnams and the Indonesias, all of whom, as you know, uh, will be part of the G10. So he said, uh, I'd just like to invite you now. You don't have to learn Portuguese, but we'd like to have you come down and, and be with us, and maybe the following year we can do it in China, and the following year we can do it in India. It was greeted with a sort of laughter, but it was a faint laughter, <laughs> uh, because the truth is that in the G7 that was there, UK will not be in it, Germany will not be in it, France will not be in it, and, uh, unless they're part of the European Union, uh, which of course would merit a position in the top eight countries. Now the importance of that was both amusing and politically very interesting, because it called into attention of the G7, I think, in a way that had not previously been possible since they'd never been invited before. The fact that the world is being rebalanced. And a huge rebalancing in relation to Asia. And what we've seen in recent times is, I think, a move that confirms this in many different ways. First of all, the linkage and the recognitions by China and Japan that historic rivalries have to be put out of the way. And if not forgotten, that these are built upon in terms of moving forward. And we have seen in the last several years that Prime Minister Wen Jiabao uh, went to China, and we have seen that the Japanese Prime Minister, President Fukuda, in December of 2007, went to China. I don't have the time to read you uh, the totality of their speeches. They're available on the internet. But I read them very late last night because they're fascinating in terms of the way in which each leader reached out to the other great country in terms of trying to put behind them the issues of the past and talk about the interdependence that was there in terms of the future. In fact, one of the phrases was a new era where the past uh, does not overshadow the present and the future and talk of cultural and economic exchanges. Very, very clear indications from both leaders uh, of the importance of this development. And development which, by the way, is important because of Japan's economic position in the world, but which needed to be followed up, as it was followed up, uh, by similar meetings between China and India. If you remember that China and India today represent more than a third of the world's population in two countries. Did in three and a half a total of six million people on the planet. And they will continue to occupy nearly a third of the planet in terms of the number of people that are there, with uh, India moving ahead of China in terms of the number of people by the year 2025 because of the birth policy in China. But this issue of the overall growth in terms of this region, which as I told you, before varies from the 80-20 of the rich countries and the developing countries, so that this region has nearly 60% of global GDP by 2050. This shift is something that the people of my generation is very, very hard to accept, to adjust to the changes that are likely to come. Now, what we see in terms of American universities is actually fascinating as I speak at this university. There are 88,000 Chinese students in the United States at university level, and 68,000 Indians studying in the United States. A fraction of that amount is going in the other room. A fraction of that amount is going in the other room. And so it's not that Asia, in terms of least of India and China, is not preparing itself for the new world. It is that there is a myopia on the part of the West in terms of 
uh, the developments in Asia. I, I am embarrassed to say uh, that until 10 years ago when I was in Australia and my native land and pushing for it, we only had one course at university level in China. Just one course. It's ludicrous <laughs> when you think of the level of trade. It's ludicrous when you think of uh, where the future is going. And thank God that is changing and has changed a lot. But we have decades to catch up in terms of where we're going and uh, the preparation that is necessary. There is just a serious imbalance uh, between uh, what is happening on the ground economically and the preparation that, that is being done for it, uh, in, uh, certainly in the West. So my message is really very clear. It is that you're living in a part of the world where the future economic activity is going to be. It's not without its challenges for a country the size of China, given the scale and the power of India and China. But it's also not something that you can ignore in terms of the response that you might have uh, in terms of writing your economy and preparing whatever elements there are for specialized activity. I understand this country is the third largest producer of automobiles in the world today, if my informant at lunch is correct, and it's none other than the president of this university. So I assume that million three cars that he spoke of is a correct number. So it can be done, uh, but it now needs to be done within the context of a really much better understanding of what is going to happen in the region around you in terms of the creation of these giants, in terms of the economic, social, technological advances that will happen in those countries. And also, may I say, a latent challenge for those countries, for the people in them that are left behind, uh, rather than those that move to the middle class. And for all of us, a challenge of what happens in Africa. Uh, this is not something that we can just push aside. It will be 25% of the world's population. And we cannot anticipate an Africa which has limited or no growth in a world of stability and peace. It's just too difficult today to contemplate that and is not something that uh, we should plan on. So the future looks good for Asia, not without problems, but with real opportunities and a rebalancing of the world more akin as I said earlier, to the world of the early 1830s or of the world of 1500s. It's funny how the world has a habit of turning around and replaying themes from previous periods. But that is the future. That is where we're going. And I also noticed that it's 40 minutes, which is what I was told to speak. And I'm very happy to be to have the opportunity, Mr. President, to speak here. Thank you all very much. I think there's time for questions, is that right? Yes. Or lectures, if anyone would like to. And, and uh, we'll give you the microphone. Okay. Uh, Thailand is a little bit like what it was in 1916, before the revolution. It has great aristocracy, divinities, wealth and power, and a slaving population. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, will they learn from the rest of the world uh, what's happened in Australia and the rest of the world? Will they learn? Yeah. Or not? I think Thailand is a kind of microcosm of what's happening on all planets. It's all together a big wish mark in this country. And my question is, what do you think is the future of Thailand? <laughs> Well, I think I should pass that to the president of the university <laughs> uh, to answer. Uh, I've been here all of the day. And perhaps that's the best way to answer such a question. The question, as you've probably heard, uh, if you didn't, is that uh, the gentleman is concerned about the aristocracy and the inequity and the corruption in the country and wonders what is the future of Thailand. And the answer is, I don't know. That was the censorship coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's very clear that I shouldn't answer the question. <laughs> uh, 
Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, the question was, uh, do I have any views on the meltdown in the American markets and does it affect my views? And uh, the answer is that um, I'd have to say I'm pretty pessimistic. Uh, I don't know whether the press is here, but if they, if they, if it is, um, maybe I should change that and say I have some questions. Uh, 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 about the future, but but I think that there is currently in the United States a pretty active debate going on uh, between the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve and some few that back him to say that the current crisis can be ameliorated and dealt with uh, by additional funding going into the economy by the stimulus package that President Bush brought in at $150 million, and by a reduction in rates from the current 3% to something more, which essentially, given inflation would be zero, real rates of, of uh, 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 real rates of uh, cost of money. Um, my own view is that that is going to be difficult to write the situation because of the overhang of past successes, uh, particularly in mortgage-backed securities, in, in various forms of, um, of extraordinary financial instruments that have been created, um, dependence on guaranteeing agencies uh, for the additional prices will drop from their and that would wipe out between 4,000 billion and 6,000 billion of household wealth. That number's right. The question is, will they drop 20 or 30 percent? Further losses from the existing subprime mortgages, uh, which are now estimated at 250 to 300 billion, as you've seen in American institutions are writing down of substantial amounts of these losses, but he's suggesting that it could go as high as the estimate of Goldman Sachs, which is 400 billion. It's quite easy to throw around 100 billion here and 100 billion there, but actually it's quite a lot of money. Uh, here and their dollars are perhaps worth a little bit less than the bar, a little less. The credit crunch, which spread from mortgages to a wide range of consumer credit. Consumer credit. Because if there isn't money around, time to go into mortgages, won't go anywhere else. The downgrading of the monoline insurers, not implausible. They would just be confirmed with their ratings, but I don't think anybody really feels how great <laughs> that decision was. And that could lead to a $150 billion write down on asset backed securities, which now depend on the, on the uh, insurers. A meltdown in the commercial property market. A bankruptcy of a large regional or national bank, similar to what happened with the savings and loans in 1989. Big losses on reckless leverage buyouts. That's not impossible anyway, um, because of the nature of the financing of some of these purchases. A wave of corporate defaults that, according to this theory, would add another $250 billion. A meltdown of the shadow financial system, shown by distress of hedge funds, special investment vehicles, and made more difficult by the fact that they have no direct access to banks to build them up. A further collapse of stock prices in the market, drying up of liquidity, and then finally a vicious circle of losses, capital reduction, credit construction, forced liquidation, fire sale of assets at the low fundamental prices. I have to say that's a pretty dire view. But it is a view which I give you not because I agree with every step in it, but because the people who are asserting this are not stupid. And uh, Professor Rubini himself is no other nor is Martin Wolf. And so Elaine and I have come here now to see where we can go in Thailand and we can live quietly. <laughs> in the countryside. 
Now, many of you have any ideas we'd like to know. But if that 12-step process is anywhere near likely to happen, and I would doubt that it will happen in completeness. In fact, I would bet it won't happen in completeness because there'll be intervention by the authority. But the truth of the matter is that every one of those assertions in the 12-point plan is at least plausible. And the combination of them is disastrous. I don't think it'll happen, but I do think we're in for a pretty tough year. And I think you'll find that for quite a number of countries and for quite a number of institutions, you will have periods of negative growth, two quarters of negative growth, which will talk of recession uh, in this coming 12 months. And one of those could easily be the United States, where the projection of growth has been reduced successively uh, to now close to 1% this year as the same point where we start at 3.5%. So I don't think it's a very good moment. Uh, but I would say that what I've just read to you is an extreme statement, but not without plausibility in relation to a number of the aspects of it. Yes, uh, Just to follow up on the, the American issue about this um, what I would simply call uh, another example of the excessive uh, money supply coming to the U.S. Uh, property market and all that. Uh, this money supply came in by the reserve of, say, Japan to be accelerated by, later by the, uh, the Chinese reserve and all that. Now, basically, this is again, not using that money in your own society and then putting it into the U.S. society, betting on the property market and all that. Some people are saying, which I don't quite understand, and I'm seeking that understanding, that uh, Japan or China should find a way of using that money instead of putting it to, into the U.S. society and all that. What is your recommendation? Well, the first thing is that it's hard to ignore the United States, which has, after all, and the global GDP is about 40 trillion, it will take 14 or 15 trillion dollars at that time. China might be one thousand trillion dollars today. So, it's not that the United States becomes negligible, it is still a major economic force. But to get back to your question, the accumulation of reserves today is significantly, not, a, not solely, but significantly in terms of the leadership in terms of China and Japan. They rank one and two in terms of the accumulation of reserves. And together, it's over two trillion dollars, or six trillion dollars of reserves. Trillion being a thousand billion dollars. It's a hell of a lot of money. And what many commentators are saying is that putting it into U.S. Treasury securities and things and holding it in money markets is costing them a lot of money, but they're not going to break the market. It has hurt them more to break the United States, and they can't break the United States. The United States, for them, is an integral part of their own development. But what we're seeing is completely new territory. You're finding the Chinese, you're finding the Russians, you're finding other accumulators of these reserves all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, in the last months, putting together very substantial pots of money for investment in the United States to buy distressed assets, to buy companies, to invest in institutions like Citibank. You know, where did the $19 billion for Citibank come from? Largely from these funds, from these companies. Five million from Dubai, four million from somewhere else. Um, these are not the people that would normally have been expected to be the preferred shareholders of these companies. Approaches to China, approaches to Russia. These are really fantastic moves in terms of an economic power. But the economic power is now shifting. 
in terms of available funding. And if you have a sick United States, with, when I say sick United States, when you have institutions in the United States that have been overly aggressive in terms of leverage and in terms of their financing, to stabilize them, you need funding to come from somewhere. And so the anger at foreign intervention currently is being assuaged uh, because they're coming into minority positions and the money is coming in in, in a very in a quiet way, but in huge sums of money. So I think this next 12 months, two years, three years is going to be an extraordinarily interesting time when the reality of the accumulation of funds is being confronted by the self-image of the OECD countries as being the people that are driving uh, the world at a time when the economic weight is shifting. It's shifting. And I really thank God I'm retiring. <laughs> <laughs> because I would hate to be there um, confronting these issues. I think it is unlikely that I will be the next Secretary of the Treasury, and I'm rather glad that that's the case. Uh, but I hope whoever it is and who is young and vigorous will understand that the rules that were established in the last 25 years are going to be severely challenged by the realities of the current situation. And I think, quite modestly, that is a correct statement. So. I appreciate your comment on how the whole scheme will work based on the practical categorization if you shift the categories a little, in terms of looking at the upper tiers, the middle class. I think someone wants you to have a, a speaker, a microphone. Do you mind repeating the question? Okay. Okay. I do appreciate your categorization of your of the four speed rule, based basically on your geographical and historical growth and size of the economy. But if you shift the categorization to looking at the extreme poor, if, if you can segment them to be the stubborn poor and the, and the, and the relative poor, then look at the middle class which is vanishing, and the upper tiers. How would you care to see the world in the, in the coming future, in the light of the World Bank effort to eliminate, eliminate some of the poverty in the world, the Millennium Development Goal, yet you see clearly the disparity that is increasing and the extreme difficulty of eliminating poverty. You see within each country, if you look even more focused in each country, given the, the powerful emerging countries like India and China that you mentioned, within it there is a tremendous amount of disparity which needs to be addressed. Would there be internal explosion? Would there be stability and peace internally, given the whole ideas of income and wealth distribution, which is a problem that we can see clearly everywhere? And even if you look at a, a, a bigger picture, when you have this issue of 911, partly it has to do with philosophical understanding of how to deal with different ways of living between the pros pros prosperity in the West and the people who are not so well off and are the underdog in a world where the globalization game is being set by those who are well off. How could we care to comment on this? Yeah. Well, the first thing I would say is that I think that your assertion that the middle class is declining is, is not substantiated by the facts. You will have at least a billion moving into the middle class in China and India uh, within the course of the next 15 or 20 years, a billion people. That's not a trivial number of people. But it doesn't deal with the issue that you're speaking of, which is what happens to the people that are below that level. What happens to the poor in those countries? And what happens to the poor in the countries 
such as the African, the group four that I spoke of, which will grow from a billion to two and a half billion people. That is an issue which I think the governments of India and China, and I'm sad to say almost only in the last five years, have really started to confront. In the, in the 16th Central Committee of the Communist Party Congress in 2006, and I quote from it, among the current limitations to achieve a harmonious society, the resolution mentions, one, a serious imbalance in the social and economic development between urban and rural areas and across 31 provinces of China. So the first thing that they recognized was that, and, and as you know, there, there's a differentiation in incomes that between four and five times between the wealthiest provinces in China and the least wealthy provinces in China. And the same or similar statistics are certainly there for urban and rural. I think it's around three and a half times. So you have this distinction within China, which will leave several hundred million people still, if not in absolute poverty under a dollar a day, still significantly different, maybe under $2 a day or under $2.50 a day, when you have a, right, a much larger middle class. We're going to have to look again at the statistics of poverty, which up to now have been measured by extreme poverty under a dollar and less extreme poverty under two dollars and so you come up with a number of three billion people that are under two bucks a day. Uh, that's going to have to be replaced by a different measure. And on that different measure, you're hitting at something which I think is going to be a core issue for China and for India and for other countries in the Asian region. Maybe not just in the Asian region, but significantly in the Asian region, which is what happens to the rump? What happens to the bit that's left at the bottom? And there, what Hu Jintao is saying is, we've got to get on to that right now. He goes on to talk about the population and environmental problems that are worsening. A large portion of the populations find the national situation in employment, social safety nets, income distribution, education, medical care, housing, occupational safety, public order, seriously deficient. I mean, it's just about covered everything that you have in terms of government intervention on life. And, and a similar thing was said in the ASEAN meetings, the 10th ASEAN ministerial meetings, uh, and the summit that was held in November 2007. The November ASEAN summit talked about energy, environment, climate change, sustainable development, and poverty. There is an awakening now with this issue of poverty, environment, sustainable development cannot be left to the middle class just as the middle class. It's a great thing to have this engine that's coming forward. But if we don't do something to prepare for the people that are left behind, we're going to be in deep trouble in terms of turmoil in our economies and in terms of our societies. Now, I don't know what the answer is, but the one thing that I'm sure of is that finally, the issue of poverty is on the agenda. The truth of the matter is that in terms of donations or assistance given by the so-called rich world, it's now running at about $120 billion a year. But when you analyze it in terms, as I've done, in terms of how much reaches poor people, you would be aggressive if you said more than 30 to $40 billion. Aggressive. The rest goes in overheads, the rest goes in losses, the rest goes in cheating, the rest goes in uh, advisory services. Uh, uh, the, the truth of the matter is that maybe it's 30 to 40 billion. And the 30 to 40 billion is not going to the places that need it most. Africa has been stable, in my judgment, for the last 20 years, in terms of money. Which is, uh, made a big song and dance about how it's increasing, but it hasn't. So, what I'm taking some comfort in is that finally, in addition to Gordon Brown, whom I mentioned before, and the new president of Germany, the new leader of Germany, the president is, actually the president's very good too, it's Horst Kohler, who was my colleague at the Monarchy Club. 
So Germany is taking an interest in it. So you've got Germany and the UK. You've always had the Scandinavians, the Nordics, who have a serious interest and who are well above the 0.7 in terms of their contribution. You'll remember the world agreed that the rich world would give 0.7% of their income uh, for development expenditures. The United States is about 0.15 at this moment. Uh, so finally, it looks as though people are starting to wake up to the fact uh, that this is a critical issue. But I ask you <laughs> to look at the current presidential yes. debates. Mm. Last year, I asked Jim Lehrer, who was an American uh, television commentator, and who was doing the debates uh, between the two candidates, if he would ask a question on development. Because I said, Jim, there's never been a question on poverty and development. And these are presidential candidates. It took exactly 90 seconds for him to ask it and for the answer. And he swore that he would never ask another question <laughs> on poverty and development. Because in the United States, and it includes in this debate, you haven't heard a word from either Hillary Clinton or from... You had a reference by Obama to it because of his history. Uh, and, but it's not a political issue. It will not win you an election in the United States. In fact, the more you talk about it, the less likely you are to have support. <laughs> so so what, what troubles me greatly, and it's not just in the UK, it is that this $120 billion figure, which everybody talks about, is not a real figure. It is not, there is no real recognition on the part of the rich world that they are interdependent with the developing world. And in any event, the time frame within which both poverty and environment is going to impact them is well beyond the immediate political cycle. It's not going to be in the four years or five years or two years that people are elected for. And the result is that you get domestic issues like this. But the truth is, that the world is becoming more and more interdependent. And this is not just said by me because I was active in that field and had to say it, but it's manifestly true. And the issues of interdependence and the issue of global stability cannot be dealt with on a whim from week to week. This is something that takes decades to deal with, decades. And it requires education requires education of all our young people to understand the difference in the world. People of my generation, it's too late. But we have to do something with the next generation. And I regard this as a hugely important subject, and I think I'm probably running out of time. Okay? Uh, gentlemen, over the years, sir, thank you. in UTCC. And um, I recently learned in my macroeconomics class about fiat currency. About what? Fiat currency. Fiat currency. Is that how you say it? Fiat. Fiat. You can tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm not too sure about it. Basically, I've learned that it's not based on gold, but it's based on like fake money or something. It's like based on debt. Mm -hmm. And I recently learned about it. Um, so banks spend money not on a uh, full reserve system, but on a fractional reserve system. Uh, this, this is all new to me, so I'm quite worried about it. Um, so the money I get paid with, the money I borrow from a bank, is not actually real gold. It's, it's paper money made out of thin air or something. And um, when I heard about this, I was quite worried. So I was thinking, um, is this true? Is it true that, that central banks like in England and in the Federal Reserve pump up this fake paper money? Or well, you're seeing now this paper money, which is the dollar at the moment, shifting more than 25% in its value against other currencies in the last several years. It's lost 25% of its value. And the truth of the matter is that there has always been a differentiation in the strength of currencies based on domestic activities and their international ramifications in terms of trade and in terms of investment. What you're seeing today is that the leading economy in the world, which has been the United States, is subject to internal excesses, which make other people think that the dollar doesn't have 
the value that it once did. And in the year 2000, the debt of the US government was six trillion, it's now nine trillion dollars in the space of eight years. That makes the value of the dollar, given that that's a debt of the United States, that prints these things, quite worrying. And when you then look also at the strength of the financial institutions, in the way that I described them earlier, you have to say that the United States at the moment is having a lot of problems. Now, if that happens, people tend to run away from the dollar into something else. And so they're running more into the euro, and they're running, as you can see, perceptibly into gold. Because the gold price is now whatever it is, $1,000 an ounce or something, something enormous. And, and a lot of people thinking it'll double. So, so, so I would say to you that you know, you have reason to be concerned and what most people I, are doing. How should I protect myself in the future if it, say the dollar does just completely drop? Sorry? How, what should I do? What's your opinion? How should I protect, protect myself as like an average person? If you're a rich person, I would, I would, um, I would probably buy some euros and buy some euros. gold and, 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 uh, <laughs> and, uh, and find a rich girlfriend. <laughs> 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 Uh, yes. Could I ask the next question, please? Since I'm oh, okay. up some fun. Okay, uh, I'm David Steen. So thank you for your uh, brilliant uh, exposition of the problems. Uh, as an aside, can I suggest, as a Thai resident, that you try Chiang Mai? Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, my question is: Having given this changing world scenario. What are the inferences in changes to the World Bank and the other UN agencies uh, in their role and function? How should, could such changes be achieved? And could they ever be achieved in time? Uh, having been a, an ex-UN employee, I know the problems of such change and the, the, the time scale. But I very much appreciate your comments. I think that... Uh it's quite obvious that there are a whole segment of developing countries which no longer need the financial support of the World Bank uh, or of UN agencies. But what they still need is some technical help, and that's what's happening on education, on health care, on the passing on of information of what worked in one country and what didn't work. And, and that is, that is still alive and well at the World Bank. And I can speak to the World Bank more than I can speak about the UN system. Although I believe it to be true of UNDP and, and some of the UN agencies which are now, um, now being run by ex-World Bankers. And you probably know. Uh, but the more significant thing is I think that Bob Zellick, who is now running the World Bank, is very clearly signaling that the weight of lending from the World Bank now must be focused on Africa and the poor countries. Uh, it has to be. And I think that what Bob is doing now is preparing the place and preparing the shareholders for an understanding that Africa is front and center. And he's just been around to get the Ida replenishment which is the International Development Agency replenishment, which is for soft loans, if you like, for these countries, and was successful, not only in achieving its target, but exceeding its target. So I think that you have the right leadership of the World Bank now in Bolsonaro. I think there is a willingness and a necessity to change. Um, I mean, there is just no point in waiting around the land of China. Uh, it's just preposterous, and the same is true in terms of India. On the other hand, there are still a number of things that the Chinese would like to have from the World Bank in terms of knowledge. <coughs> the same is true of India. If you get to Bangladesh and Myanmar and a few other places in Asia, they still need the money from the World Bank. But it's a much smaller proportion, and so they, along with African countries, become the target, I think, that the World Bank needs to have and should have. And after all, there's still going to be two and a half or three billion people uh, in the, uh, there'll still be a third of the world uh, in 2050. So it's not a trivial number. Uh, yeah. um, 
Thank you, Mr. Hortensen, for a wonderful presentation on the four-speed world. Uh, my question is more fundamental. Maybe to an extent, I'm going to speak a few words from what you just stated. Uh, I'm talking about basically the fundamental issues like poverty. Uh, let's say in poverty it leads to uh, social issues, leads to health, it leads to aid, you did touch upon all that. Uh, I'm also, I'd like to understand from you, on the one hand we have issues of drug licensing and so on and so forth, uh, and the crude price, the gold price, everything hitting the roof and uh, going bust. With this kind of scenario, uh, what kind of interventions are required to ensure, if you look at the oil companies, the pharma companies, hand over fist, money is being made. But the poor guys on the street is struggling to get even cancer drugs and so on, which is pathetic state in most parts of Asia. So are there some controls possible to even out this disparity, primarily arising out of economic disparity? Uh, would World would Bank and some of these agencies do something? Because these are ground realities. You did touch upon education, yes, wonderful. But that's going to take decades to really catch up because you need to start from the grassroots. And not at the same time saying you haven't done enough work, but the speed is inadequate to my people. Thank you. Well, I think that it's not going to be very uh, effective to tell the oil producers to reduce the price from 100 to $50 or $25. Uh, they're not going to do it, and they control the resource. So I wouldn't start with the oil price. Um, but I would do one thing, and that is if I were... And, and we're seeing signs of it now with the leadership of China and India. And if you talk to Wen Jiabao and Manmohan Singh, they're saying exactly what I'm about to say. Is that the solution is in China and India. It's not in the US or in Canada or in Norwegian countries. Uh, unless you get a different ethic and a different sense of responsibility in China and India, you're not going to solve the problems. No outsider will solve the poverty problem in India. My wife and I have been through hundreds of slums and places throughout England and spent weeks there. And it's the local initiatives which will solve it. It's not an intervention by the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank or some rich American coming along. These are national challenges. And what troubles me in China and India in 10 years ago was that there's, it wasn't politically popular and there were not very many leaders who were prepared to say that. It does seem to me now that there are some. And given the potential of China and India in terms of its total GDP, by 2050 of being the first and the third economies in the world, they ought to start now thinking about what they're going to do with the resources. And the resources don't all have to go to major companies and major entrepreneurs. And the time to think of it is now, as is the time for education and healthcare. It's just not enough to say that it takes time to change education. Of course it does. It's a decade and maybe longer. But you have to start. And, uh, you know, I think that the leadership in Chidambaram's latest budget, if you saw that, I know whether you're from India, but if you saw the government's latest budget which came out yesterday, uh, they're talking about forgiveness of, the, of debt for the poorest people, but a 20% increase in the education budget uh, and a small increase in the health budget. I think the health budget's too low, by the way, in terms of India. But, but the fact that they're prepared, you know, the number one item on his agenda was education is, I think, just exactly what it should be. So I think... Uh, I think you're starting to get enlightened leadership. I just wish it had been there a few more years ago. Uh, in uh, recent days, uh, Gaza has once again uh, been uh, seized with uh, violence. Uh, given your experience there during the disengagement process, uh, do you, what, what do you see as the way forward? What's the next best step? Well, I think that we need to see a continuation of the discussions between between the Israeli leadership and the Palestinian leadership uh, in the way that it is now progressing. And I think you are seeing, obviously, the greater interest being taken by President Bush and uh, the Secretary of State 
most of his recent visit to the Middle East and his projected visit in May. The objective which the United States has, and hopefully they may be able to achieve, is that with Ehud Olmert as the Prime Minister of Israel and Abu Mazen as the leader of the West Bank faction of the Palestinians, they may be able to get an agreement which would then encompass Gaza as well, and that would lead to a solution. But the sort of thing that's happened in the last couple of days is an example of the tensions on both sides. You're not going to have rocket attacks from Gaza on uh, suburbs in Israel. And when they happen, you're going to have an overreaction to go back in. Because you can't send rockets back in and hit the people that are perpetrating it, unfortunately. And when that happens and 35 people are killed, uh, it's not surprising that Abu Mazen says, let's stop the negotiations, at least temporarily. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I spent a lot of time there, and I'm just back from a trip to other parts of the Middle East. And there's a lot of hope, but and there's a lot of frustration. Um, but there's a lot of individual egos on the line in, the, in, the, in both sides. And um, I'm not sure that people will rush to get uh, a settlement in um, before Bush departs. If there is a new president going to come in, then we'll be responsible to make sure the thing works. So I have some doubt myself as to whether it will happen in this year. Although I very much hope, and so many Palestinians and Israelis, that a framework will be established in the Green Report, uh, which will include an approach to borders and an approach to Jerusalem, uh, and an approach to return, uh, all three of which are essential, but which are very, very difficult issues. And probably in the end will not be agreed upon until you have a whole package where one side, where you've got a package and you say, I'm going to take this pay and you get this benefit, I'm going to take this pay and this benefit. What you're not going to have is a serial series of negotiations until you have a complete package on both sides where you can say, great, I'll take that. And that's, I think, the great flaw in what is happening now. What is needed is a, is a complete solution. And I personally don't think it'll happen in Syria, but I don't think it happened one thing after another. I mean, everything is linked to everything else. And as you know, the Palestinians want to start with Jerusalem and the Israelis want to finish with Jerusalem. So there is some difficulty. What I do understand is that Abu Mazen and, uh, and Ehud Olmert seem to be getting along pretty well until a few days ago. And when something like this happens, it's, it's undoubted that you will have a cessation of negotiations. I think, Mr. President, before everybody leaves, shouldn't we call this to a halt? Um, <laughs> yeah, may I allow me the last question from the distinguished uh, guest over here? Uh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're tired, but... Um, I'm not tired. <laughs> I, just, I just think you must be tired. I, uh, I'd like to raise the issue of global uh, governance. But before doing so, I'd like to thank you for your speech, for the good story of Asia. Uh, we appreciate that very much. I, in fact, I experienced this good story of Asia when I was attending the World Bank I mean, uh, meeting last October in Washington, D.C. I felt that people were so friendly to me, you know, wanted to talk to me. But very really often uh, they asked me, are you from China? <laughs> when I said I'm from Thailand, you know, they slowly walked away. So, <laughs> So it's obvious that uh, Asia to them meant China rather than Thailand, but never mind. Uh, on this uh, issue of, of global governance, uh, you haven't discussed it very much, but I'm sure you're very well aware of it. As all of us know, uh, formerly we had this uh, global governance very much dictated or, or given to us by the Bretton Woods institutions, one of which you, you, you were involved with. Now, with the so-called second speech countries' influence coming up, and obviously they are exercising their influence. Uh, you talk about China in Africa, 
you can see China also in Laos, in Cambodia, and so on. So, uh, what is your scenario of this uh, global governance uh, when the uh, institution, the Bretton Woods institution, institutions are somewhat declining in terms of their influence? Uh, and when these countries are, are taking their place, you know, we used to be familiar with democratization, liberalization, privatization, and all these uh, uh, churn, 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 you know, from, from Bretton Woods institutions. Uh, but next 10 years, 15 years, please tell us your, your view, your scenario on global governance. Thank you. Well, I think, first of all, starting at the top, the, the G7 needs to be the G10 or the G15. And I think that uh, that is inevitable and is already happening with an expansion of the G7. It's, it's lunacy to have um, a small European country in the G7 when China and India are not. It's just silly. And I think that's what President Lula was saying at the meeting that I'm describing, and I think that that is, that is generally accepted. So you'll see change at the top level. Maybe the club will stay together and they'll meet separate days, I don't know, but, but, but um, certainly that would. And the second thing is that there is already a move uh, in the World Bank and in the fund to change the voting. Uh, I tried very hard, uh, but it was impossible. Uh, there was a minor change made in the last couple of years to expand the voting rights of China. But there needs to be a complete revamping of it. But if that happens, then there needs to be a complete revamping of the capital contributions of these countries and the willingness to stand behind the bank. Now, that is now much more possible than it was five years ago, because the reserves of these countries uh, that need greater representation are now able that they can, in fact, substantiate their capital contribution and the call on capital that would be required, which would not have been perhaps as creditworthy years ago. So I think you will see that happening. The third thing that is clearly happening, even when I was running the bank, is that developing countries generally, and in particular China and India, but not limited to them, speak out a hell of a lot more on what is going on with the institution. They have bigger offices, they have better people, and they are better prepared. And it's not just at the bank. I hear this from my friends in a number of the international agencies, uh, that some of the best people now representing governments come from the emerging uh, powers in the developing world. But I think it started and it's irrevocable. Um, it is impossible in a world with so many changes, like I just described, in relation to the credit markets in the United States, with borrowings from Arab countries and China and here and other as well, uh, that you can run the world in the way you did when you had all the control over the first rates. It's just very clear that it has to change. And I think there is a lot of evidence today that it will change, and I think the construction of the international institutions that you describe. Uh, there'll be a lot of um, there'll be a lot of bargaining and there'll be a lot of to and fro but I don't think uh, anybody has any doubt that these institutions must change or they'll be irrelevant. Uh, there'll be new institutions we set up. Uh, and uh, I don't think anybody wants that. So I think there's a very good chance that you'll have a restructuring of these institutions. Well, it won't be tomorrow, it'll be over a period of weeks. Thank you, I know the last chance is finished, but uh, uh, yes, uh, from here. I'm from the Chinese Embassy. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, thank you. Actually, I do have a specific question to ask, but since you have talked so much about China, I just want to thank you for your attention you gave to my country. And, uh, I'm actually Chinese. <laughs> And uh, in addition to your address, I would like to put some comment on that. In connection with the environmental issue uh, you mentioned about China, and uh, uh, thank you for so much data, uh, which I just uh, hear it for the first time. And uh, uh, I want to add something um, about the attitude of Chinese government. 
Uh, as is known, the Chinese government now is adopting a scientific development policy. And uh, that means uh, our government uh, pays much more attention to the environmental issue. And they are not only speaking about it, they are actually doing something about it. Here I can give you some of the examples. Like we are shutting down the uh, factories which overpopulated the uh, environment. And now we are considering to, to, to uh, cancel the use of uh, uh, plastic bags. And in, a, in our weather forecast, we even predict the degree of the sky clearance every day. I think it's unique in the world. No country has such uh, attached so much great importance to the clear clearance of the sky. So <laughs> that's what I want to, to, to let you know. But still, we need to development. As you have mentioned, we still have so many people under the poverty line. So I think China should be allowed to address the environmental issue in a step-by-step -step manner. Thank you. Thank you. Look, I have a tremendous um, regard for what the Chinese government is now doing, and I quoted from your last 16th plan, and I think they're very serious about it. And I think uh, on the views of the people themselves, the people very much have expressed their views uh, prior to that Congress. Uh, but the truth of the matter is you have a huge problem. And if you go to the Beijing Olympics, uh, you will see the problem uh, when you get there. Uh, I've recently been to Beijing, and it's not an easy city. And in the case of India, they're opening a coal-fired power plant every week, uh, which just gives you an idea of what India is doing. So I, I, I'm not suggesting that it's hopeless. I don't think it is. But the increase in utilization of power in your country and the development will lead to greater environmental damage, both in terms of water and in terms of the environment and in terms of other things. And I think your government is conscious of it, but the pace of your economic growth is such that it's going to be a very difficult thing for them to deal with. But given that in the last five year plan, the two issues that they talked about were inequality and environment as the first two items in the five year plan gives me hope that that's what they believe. And it must be something that's popular because it was done as a popular. So uh, I look forward to coming back in 40 or 50 years time and seeing what you've done. Thank you very much. So on behalf of the organizer, I would like to express my sincere thanks for such a remarkable and challenging speech in dialogue. We see that although he is retired, he still has drawn us to our attention about the importance of bridging all gaps occurring around the clock, like uh, the name of his speech, North, East, South and West. The issues like economic uh, environment, poverty, inequality facing many countries in Asia. And uh, only bridging all these together to be smaller, global peace and stability will occur. So this is really a very challenging issue. And we would love to uh, thank you. After this, ladies and gentlemen, we have the refreshment out there to like for you to relax and you can take this opportunity to have a word or ask some more questions from Mr. Walkinson. Thank you very much. And we hope that you enjoy this speech and probably come back again later in the future when we have a great event. Uh, for our distinguished guests, we would like you to ask and your excellencies, please come to the podium. We'd like to have the group picture, group picture in the front. A group picture, please.